recording too. Um, what I decided to do is I was saving all the, I haven't been recording that many, but I started recording recently and I've been saving them on the, my, on Google drive, but I realized it takes up too much space. So I'm uploading them to uh, YouTube and keep them all there. I should have done that a long time ago. Oh, great. I'm going to look forward to the ones I missed. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, okay. We're going to reread. Actually, I'm just going to paraphrase. Paragraph 23, Cuff Gimel. So you can find that. Um, let's see. That's uh, should be around page 446, 447, somewhere around there in your book. And I'm muting everybody. Who's not? Let's see. Okay, got everyone. I'm, I got everyone muted. Obviously, if you need to say something, please unmute yourself. Um, okay. So what the 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 uh, rabbi just said. First of all, before that, the the king said, "Hey, you know what? Look, you guys, you Jews may have been on the top of the pile at one time, but look at your situation, and uh, and the Christians and the Muslims are doing so much better. Obviously, God has chosen them. Not obviously, but it seems like this, this the tide has shifted towards them. Uh, and besides, this, look where you are. You're in Galut. You're in exile. So I guess God's not too happy with you. And and besides which." Um, you really should be fixing this situation and you're not, uh, remember this is a few hundred years ago, you might as well be talking to us today. You're in Galut, you're in exile. <clears throat> so um, it's really a black mark for you. And uh, the fact that your leaders haven't done anything about it, the people haven't done anything about it, it's a problem. So in paragraph 23, Kaf Gimel, the, the Rav responds very nicely. And he says that, look, what you're finding as a fault, which indeed there's a problem with, and we're going to see with that, with, the, it, with Rav Avedir's commentary, there's a problem that we seem to be suffering for no reason because we really could end this galut, could all go back to Israel. But he says, I do want to point out one important fact that all the suffering we've been through in galut, we could have avoided by people just saying a couple of words that they want to become Christian, they want to become Muslim, and then they would have avoided all of this, um, all this problem. Of the uh, of all the trials and tribulations of the galut, but they didn't, and because they didn't, therefore it's it's a positive that shows how much emuna they have, and there's something positive in here, and that's where we left off. And I'll take a look now at a relatively longer piece from Rav Avin. We're going to spend a lot of time with him today, by the way. Okay, here we go. Here's what he says: the piskazo in this paragraph. The rab, rabbi, wait, oh, you know what? Did I share it with you? There, now it's shared. Let me try that again. In this paragraph where the rab talks about the idea that, look, on the one hand, yeah, we're messed up because we're in Galut. He also mentions that we could have also converted and we didn't. He says, in this paragraph, the rab admits of the truth. He's, the, he's a straight man, the Rav, and he doesn't hide from the truth. He doesn't back away. He said, we, all this suffering in Galut, we really haven't been, got, there's no benefit out of it. When a person, when David Amelach said, it's good for a person to go through Yisurim, to go through problems, what's going on? The Gemara explains. Now, there's a rule. In the, in the, when it came to slaves, that if a master were to knock out the eye or the tooth of a slave, they automatically go free before their six years is up. He says, he makes a kalvachome. When it comes to the avadim, to slaves, where very specific physical problems are what less sets them free, eved mishtachrebahem me'oladonav, that which case, the, if this happened, that they had their eye knocked out or their tooth knocked out, they would go free. How much more so when a person goes through horrifically bad trials and tribulations with his entire body in neshama, it has some kind of an effect 
on him both physically and spiritually in some frame form of release of being freed. We're going to see what this means soon. Omnam, we should not exaggerate this idea and take it to an extreme, meaning, hey, it's good for us to be in Galut because the more we suffer, the freer we are to serve God. This is, that's, that's just messed up. He says, well, our people are filled with idealist people, with tzadikim, with um, we have many, many, many people. Yes, there are people who did succumb and end up converting. But the vast, vast, vast majority, the people suffered and they did not give in to the evil uh, of the not of the, uh, the Christians and the Muslims. He says, look, my dear king, they could have saved themselves with one word. They didn't. Yes, in very stressful, in, under pressure situations, at the moment of truth or of test. The inner soul, the inner Jew comes out. It's true by the majority of Jews. He's talking about what we refer to in Yiddish as the Pintaliyid, the little spark of the Jew that comes out. That they may talk a good game sometimes. Say, oh, what do we need this for? What do we have to keep Shabbat for? But when it comes down to it, vast, vast, vast majority of the Jews, when they were under whether it's pogroms or the the uh, the tzalbanim, the the um, no, the people crusaders, the crusaders. Thank you. Under the the crusaders, um, that in those kitsch situations, the vast majority of the Jews did not convert and, and did not try to get away from that their Judaism. It says that kind of mesirut nefesh, that kind of giving up your 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 life in a sense for Hashem by saying I'm willing to survive to go through all this trial and tribulations and I'm not going to just succumb and give in to become another religion. That alone, he says, is enough to wipe out all of our sins. The Gemara tells the following story: Al Yosef. A man named Yosef, who was the son of Yoshua ben Levi, Shechala, who got sick. He he fainted, and then he got healthy again. Now, he was fainted, in this case, he means he was unconscious. When he woke up, his father asked him, This is a famous story, by the way. What did you see in the heavens? What did it look like in the in, in, in Olam in, in, Haba, in heaven? Marlo, Olam Hafuraiti. I saw an upside down world. Elyonim Lamata, Vitachtonim Lamala. Those who in this world, which he's going to explain now, Misha Hashuv Khan, whoever was really important here in this world, but Olam Hazet, Sham in the Olam Haba, and Onach Shalit Cloud. They're not referred, they're not worth, they're not seen as anything. So, and the people who were seem to be low here were the ones who are on top of the pile there. Furthermore, he heard, someone who was executed by the government for, for keeping Torah and mitzvot, no one could even stand in the same area they are. Umihem, who are they? If you think it's the martyrs like Rabbi Akiva, they're like the original people. So we already know there's a, a statement that the earlier generations already are at that level that no one can stand near them. It's so great. So what is this referring to that these people who were Hagugay Malchut, you couldn't stand in their same domain? It's referring to the people, two people who were killed in the city of Lod. Papus Velulianus. Is there two brothers who lived in the city of Lod? By the way, there's a, a, a dispute. Is it Lod or Lod? And even within Lod, there's a there's a there's a dispute. Elish neachim papus v'lulianus anashim shutim two stam Jews, two plain Jews papus v'lulianus shekom ma'alata ma'ita v'meshemasru nafsham al klal Yisrael. Their greatness was that they gave up their lives for the Jewish people. How? And you're going to see after this is a long paragraph where he's going with all this. 
There was a gzera, there was an edict that the entire Jewish community was to be wiped out. And what they did was they admitted that whatever was the reason, the catalyst for this community to be wiped out, they admitted to this action, even though they were innocent. That giving up your life is even for the for the tzibur to save Am Yisrael is even greater than Talmud Torah. This is also what his son told the father after he came out of this coma. A clear world you saw. This is the father speaking to the son. Um, and here it's an upside down world. Here they give honor to the one, like the, the, the ones who rule the roost. And they don't necessarily honor the people with a good heart. And the idea of Mesirut Nefesh here, which isn't seen as anything. What exactly is the idea of giving up your, your life? It's something a person does that in his eyes is so important that he overcomes any personal idea or interest in it. In the brief, amazing statement or uh, essay of Rav Kook, which was called It was in memory of the people Members of Hashomer, regarding a very specific group of people who were killed by the Arabs when they were first trying to settle the land. Who was he lamenting? These are people who were not religious at all, not in the least. They were so far away from Torah Mitzvot. He was torn, Rav Kook, between two poles. Mechad on the one hand, because on the one hand, you're not supposed to um, uh, recognize those who have completely gone away and thrown Torah away and separated from the tzibur. So on the one hand, he's, he's torn, Rav Kook. Here you have these people who were not Shomer Torah Mitzvot at all, who were killed al Kiddush Hashem, trying to settle the land. So he's torn. On the one hand, we have this concept in the Rambam that says that a person is completely and on purpose thrown away Torah Mitzvot, that when that person dies, you don't even sit shiva for them. You, the family should sit and eat and drink. That's on the one hand. But on the other hand, those who separate themselves from the religious community in this time, they're not completely disassociated. But rather they have really become more assimilated, meaning because they've been influenced by various factors. Valkane, therefore, we're very fortunate. That these people were killed, were murdered by the Arabs, by the non-Jews. Because they were killed by the non-Jew. And were, the Arabs, they were murdered by them. You, in fact, would sit shiva for them. And again, let me finish this paragraph and I'll kind of summarize what the whole point is here. Those who were killed in Lud, meaning Lulis and Papus, uh, you couldn't even stand in the same area they were standing in Gan Eden. And he summarizes his words and says, because they were killed by um, because through Kiddush Hashem, and they put their lives in danger for the benefit of Am Yisrael, this sweetens their, their, uh, their judgment, and it erases all their sins. Adam Kazet, a person like that, the moment he's killed, he, oh, he goes through some um, unbelievable internal uh, uh, revolution. It purifies all of his sins. If a person's ego, now it goes back to our situation, goes back to the whole question. 
The people are in Galut. Look, says the the the, 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 the king. You know, Nebuch, the, the, it's a what a waste. How bad is that? And then and he says, but the, so the Grav said, if they would overcome their ego, he says, if everyone just said, you know what, it's about me, I want to save my life. There were no Jews left. Everyone could have gone easily and converted and become something else. Just the opposite. Now, let me explain what's going on here. Remember that we said that the king had a, had a very strong argument. He said, you're in Galut. You're at the bottom of the pile. You're, you're having all this suffering over generations. And for what? You were the chosen people. Look at the, look at the Christians. They were suffering. Now they're really big. These Muslims suffered. Now they're really big. They're powerful. They got money. They got power, position, everything. They got land. What's with you guys? You're in the Galut. What's with? So the king starts off on the one hand. And Rav says, on the one, you're right. You're right. We're in Galut. And, and it's our fault. We did something here. But he also have to recognize the fact that while we are going through all this suffering, we're also being Mekadesh Shem Hashem. We're also bringing Kiddush Hashem. How? Because we could have ended all this suffering. Simple. Become a Christian. Become a Muslim, renounce our religion. Now, yes, we know. We know now, especially in the last many years, this whole subject, and you don't call them Maranos, because Maranos means pigs. Uh, conversos, Jews in Spain, especially, who were, to, in order to save their lives, converted to Christianity, at least outwardly. Um, stories are legendary of how people finding out today, literally now, uh, you know, graveyards, Christian graveyards in New Mexico, they're finding with uh, looks like on the headstones, Shabbat candles and other things, women who, who go every Friday night down to their basement who are Christian to light candles, they don't know why. All these stories are legendary, but we're not talking about that's the exception because the millions and millions of Jews that did not give in to that, the millions and millions of Jews who chose to remain faithful to the religion, even if it meant to be downtrodden, to be in Galut and all that other stuff, that itself was enough to sweeten, so to speak, the din against the Jewish people, to show their, their, their connection to God, their connection to Torah and mitzvot. Now, on the one hand, it's like sounds like a lot of, let's put it in modern terms. You talk to a family that is... Uh, living in the United States. And you say, Aliyah, what are you doing in, what are you doing in Chutzlaretz? You belong in Israel. And they say, well, look, I can help Israel so much more from here than I can from there. I can make more money. I can send money. I can send my children to school there. I can support JUF. I can buy bonds. I can come as a tourist. But if I go there, I don't know what I'm going to be able to do. I, I can't do my job there. I blah, 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 a whole list of things. So that, in many cases, and I'm not saying for everybody, in many cases, it is a, it just sounds like one big table. It's one excuse. For some, by the way, I, I, for those of you who know me very well, you'll know that I went through a metamorphosis over my many past many years. I used to think that with very, very, very little exception, alias for everybody. I don't believe that anymore. I believe that... Uh, not everybody, not everybody should be here because there are people, certain types of mindset, second I saw on my computer, certain type of mindset and certain type of personality that would never survive in the land. Small as a name. It, sorry? Small name. Yes, the small name, although they may thrive here for different reasons. Um, but take the average middle of the road religious Jew um, for various reasons. I still believe the vast majority belong here. Um, but at the one hand, it sounds like the Rav is, you know, making an excuse. Look, wow, no, it's bad in Galut and all, but look, we get points for the fact that we didn't convert to become something else. We also, now, why is that not a, uh, why is that not just a Teru? It's just an excuse. So I'll give you a little background before we go on in, in the next statement that he made, the Rav makes. There is a, um, um, Gemara, the Masechah Ketubot. Some of you are definitely familiar with it. The Gemara is used as a proof text in two different directions. One, 
that you should absolutely make Aliyah. Two, you absolutely are not allowed to make Aliyah. The Gemara and the Tosfot, and there's a commentary called the Megillat Aster, and the Ramban's commentary on the Rambam. It's an entire shiur about the mitzvah of, of Aliyah Eretz Yisrael. And I, I personally have given it multiple times over the years. And it's one of those that if I just quickly looked at a couple notes, you could stand here now, I could give it for an hour off the top of my head. Not because I'm genius, but because I've done it so many times and it's so ingrained in my brain. But among those comments or the Gemara, there's a famous comment that is quoted from a Tosvot. And let me just see. Give me one second to pick up the Gemara. One second. I took the little baby one. When I when I got smicha, my uh, my chavruta bought me a set of a uh, small set of of, uh, of shas. And I used it. Now over the years, it's getting harder and harder to see it. But okay. Kuf yud bet. Okay, Kufi Yud Aleph, Amad Aleph. Okay. I'm not going to digress and make this an entire shiur. I could do this another time, but I'm not going to digress and make this entire shiur about what the Gemara is talking about, what's called the Shlosha Shavuah. By the way, when you talk about a Shavuah, a Shavuah of an oath, it's Nikevat, Shalosh Shavuot. If you talk about weeks, it's Shavuah, which is Zachar, it's Shlosha Shavuot. Unfortunately, they get mixed up a lot. But what it's called the Shalosh Shavuot, there's the Gemara talks about where the Bnei Yisrael made three oaths that they would not come and make Aliyah and mass to Israel. The Gemara discusses that. And, but along the way, there is a, a, a very small uh, Tosfo. There's a mission that starts saying that if a man is living, a man and woman are married, they live in Chutzlaretz, mm -hmm. and the man wants to make Aliyah, but the woman refuses. He's allowed to divorce her, and he doesn't owe her her ketubah money, and vice versa. The woman wants to make Aliyah, and the guy does not want to make Aliyah. He is allowed, she's allowed to demand her to get her Ketubah money, and she makes Aliyah on her own. Okay, whether that's actually put into practice, not put into practice, different question. But there is a Gemara, there's a Tosfot that says as follows. Who, uh, where is it? Who Omer La Alot? When he says he wants to make Aliyah and she says no, then he can just leave, give her a get, and not have to pay Says Tosfo. no no heg This doesn't apply nowadays. Why? Because the roads are dangerous. Furthermore, Rabbeinu Chaim says there is no mitzvah to live in Israel. Why? And this is, this is kind of shocking. You'll see why in a minute. Because there are many mitzvot that are shmita and, and shumot and masrot. And there are many punishments for not doing them right. And we can't really keep all those mitzvot properly, so it's not a good idea. So the two things in this Tosot, the second one I'm just going to mention and, and that everyone basically beats them up and says no, it makes no sense. And But there are people who look and say, how do you, you know? He's one of the Baleat Tosafot. But I want to talk about that first half of the Mishnah, of the, the Tosafot. The Mishnah said clearly, Adin, which was that if the man wants to make Aliyah, he could force the wife. If the wife wants to make Aliyah, she could force the husband. And there's financial repercussions either direction. And the Tosafot said, it's not custom today because it's dangerous to make Aliyah. So you have people today who sit in their nice homes in Chutzaretz and say, you see, Tosfot said, we can't make Aliyah, dangerous. Right. So you're going to compare travel in the 1100s to travel in the year 2020. Where here you can get on an airplane in New York with a mask and social distancing maybe. And in 10 hours, 12 hours, you're in Israel to traveling months over land and sea, marauders, having to carry all your, take all your food, not knowing if you're going to live to the next day, you're going to compare those two. So this, this Tosfot has been 
uh, when you take it into context of the time period of history that in the 1100s approximately, uh, a little bit after maybe 1200s, you say, yeah, it was dangerous. But he started off by saying that this myth, this myth, this halacha, the, the Mishnah doesn't apply today in his time because it's dangerous to travel on the roads to go to Israel. At that time, yacholiot. But that meant that if it was not dangerous, you can go. Right. You'd be permitted to do it. And the halacha would apply. Why am I mentioning all this? Because when you take a look at that Tosfot, it almost sounds like now where were they? They're in, for the most of the most for the most part these the people who were the Balea Tosafot were the, the time period the grandchildren and some were the grandchildren of Rashi, and the many, many of them were in in France in Paris in particular. Why were they in Israel? Again, it sounds like they're making an excuse. It sounds like a terutz, but no. At that time period, Basher Husham, at that moment, it was a problem getting from Paris to Israel, and it wasn't Israel, whatever it was at the time, was very dangerous. So Rabbi, so the Toso tells us, look, in our time period, forget it. We can't do it now. The, 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 the rule doesn't apply. But we take that out of context and just say, see, Toso said, it's dangerous to go to Israel. You can't go. It, 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 and someone will quote that today. It, it, that is just an excuse. So you might look at the words of Rabbi Dalevi around the same time period, just a little bit after this, and say, look, it's just making excuses. He's saying, oh, well, we're not supposed to be in Galo, but if I were here, look what we're able to accomplish because we, we didn't convert. But the truth is, it's not just a terutz. It's not just an excuse. It's tachas. It really is how it is. And it gets even deeper. And we're going to look now, the next part of the paragraph. We're in Kaf Gimel, number 23. We're in the middle where it says, the ilu hayama. Okay. And I, again, I don't know exactly what page, but you should be around page 446, 447, somewhere around there. If someone wants to mention, I'll, I'll, okay. Y'all have it? <coughs> Just give me a thumbs up or smile or nod or wave. So I know. Yeah, got it? All right. Okay, let's go on. Um, the ilu hayam masha tamavakesh bimeni. He says, in a sense, you're, you're right. That if things were to be as, ex as expected, like you expect from us, we wouldn't be in this mess that we're in. But now he brings Hashem into this mix. This is going to be a little controversial, this next paragraph. And we won't finish today because I have, I have 11 slides and I've done two. Um, but this whole next section, uh, this paragraph, let me see where, how long it is. Um, the rest of, up, of Kaf Gimel, which is kind of long, you might have a little disagreement with his approach. And I'll tell you up front that not everyone would necessarily agree with this. The bottom line is that this is part of Hashem's plan, that we should be in Galut. And that's kind of what he's going to say, but not exactly. Okay, let me just read and I'll leave out the editorial comment. But there is some hidden chokhmah in this galut of ours. It is similar to the seed that is dropped into the earth. Now, for those of you who had the chance to watch yesterday, I sent out a time-lapse photography of about a minute and a half of a seed growing. And this is the mashal. Of, there's a number of mashalim, a number of parables that the Kuzari brings throughout his book. And this is one of the ones that is also pretty well known. It's well known because I just read it the other day um, in preparing for the class um, of dropping a seed into the earth. What happens? What happens? It changes form as it disintegrates into the earth, into water, into the, into the um, what do you call? Um, what do you put down? Um, um, fertilizer. There's nothing really left that you can see. As if you were to look at it. I love the perspective. He says as follows. It's not that the water and the earth 
have an effect on the seed and change the seed? The seed has an effect on the water and on the earth, makes use of it, and then does something different with it and becomes what we know as the fruit or the, the object itself. It turns into its form that we know. The seed converts the water and converts the earth into the form it needs to be. Meaning, if I take an apple seed and I put it into the earth, when I'm watering it, the water is not to change the seed. He says the seed is changing the water and the seed is having an effect on the earth. And then eventually it grows through. We have apple that we know. It removes its husk, its outer shell and anything else. Until the heart of the fruit is purified. And then the divin, divin, divine spark can come to it. What does that even mean? It's a, so let me explain in a second. That that little seed, if you have an apple at home, a clementine, an orange, something, you take a seed out of it and look at it. What do you see? You see a seed. What you're really looking at is the DNA of another tree. Is that unbelievable when you think about it? We take these things, whether it's birth or, or planting of fruits and vegetables, that you take this seed, you bury it in the ground, and then after X amount of time, you have something to eat. And that the fruit that you get from the seed is the same fruit from which the seed came from, the same DNA, same everything. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of mashal of what this, to get it a little bit, not mashal, like an idea, that maybe will make this even stronger in your head. Now. Imagine you were 19 years old when the, the B'nai Israel had the sin with the golden calf. So you're going to go into Israel because it was 20 years and old that were determined they were not going to survive. So for 40, actually 29, uh, 38 years, less, no, whatever, you're traveling in the desert. You don't have to worry about clothes. You don't have to worry about shoes. You don't have to worry about food. Everything's provided for you. Shelter, everything. You got everything you need, the food you want to eat. It's got the mun every day. And then you get to the land of Israel. And Yoshua instructs you and tells you as follows. All these miracles are over. It's all done. There's going to be a massive change in the structure of Am Yisrael. And among those changes is there's no more mun. There's no more clouds of glory. You're going to have to make your own clothes. You're going to have to fix your own shoes, make new shoes. Oh, and by the way, for food, what you're going to do, you see these little seeds? You're going to take them and you're going to bury them in the ground. So the person looks at you and says, oh, you take a seed, you bury it in the ground and food comes up? That's a miracle. What's the perspective of you as this 19-year-old, now 39 years old, I'm telling you, so food comes from heaven, comes from God, just plops down there every day outside my tent. I open it up. There's my delivery from Amazon, amazon.god. <laughs> just thought about that. And you're good to go. But you come into Israel, and what do you do? You take this little thing, you put it in the ground, and it grows. And you get food on a tree. How that? It's, it's a miracle Hashem gave us. So that's our perspective in life. So that what he's telling us here, I'm going to see how he's playing, uh, going to play this out. I'm going to take a look at uh, Rav Avi in a minute. How he's playing this out is he's going to take this mashal, obviously, and he's going to see, we're going to see how this now will translate into Am Yisrael in Galut. But let's take for, first take a look at the next slide. Oops. How did that move you all over? Okay. Ha'uvda, this one's a little fuzzy, sorry. Ha'uvda shadayin anu begalut. The fact that we are still in the, in the exile. Eina takala shal ribono sholam. is not a mistake. Is not a hiccup from God. Is part of God's plan. When it comes to the big picture, in other words, a person, an individual in Galut may be there on his own because that's what choked. But when it comes to the big picture, for example, for those of you learning Navi right now with me, you know that Am Yisrael is going into Galut. They just were taken, the 10 tribes in the Northern Kingdom are taken into Galut. That's a godly decision based on factors. It's not just happenstance. God wanted for some reason for us to be evidently in Galut for a certain time. This is the paradox. Right? Galut is a bad thing on its own. 
the Chilul Hashem Nora. It's actually a big Chilul Hashem that there's such a thing of Jews living in Galut. It's a terrible tra- worldwide tragedy. Unlike those who tried to invent a, a, a Galut ideology, as if we say, well, Jews really are, are, are residents of the planet. In addition to being an Ezrach, a citizen of the land of Israel, sometimes they live here in Israel, sometimes they live in other countries. It's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. In Israel, this is a perspective of even Jews who live in, who are religious Jews. In their opinion, their way of life. You're not missing anything. You're not lacking anything in Galut. You have a Jewish school. You have Kashrut. You have Tamini Chachamim. Yesh Rabanim. Hakol. Chutz Medina. With the exception of not having the country itself. Therefore, there is no need for a country. Am Yisrael yachol leitkayim gam b'li Medina. Israel could also exist. Am Yisrael could exist without a country. Aval ein zadachon. This is not true. Halo a Torah melea mi azarot ka'ele. The Torah is filled with warnings like these. In ta'asu averot, if you do sins, te'anshu v'te'achu le'galut. We know that galut is a punishment. The Torah itself says it multiple times. V'lich ora. On the surface, evidently, in begalut nitan le'kayim ora chayim yudi shalem, if in the Galut, you can still keep almost a complete full Jewish life. There's really nothing bad about Galut. Aval, haemet, the truth is, shagaluti ason hayoter gadol venoral uma. That Galut exile is one of the worst, horrible, awful things for a nation. This, the being in Galut, was not just happenstance. So God wanted it for whatever reason, and he adjusted for this, or he guided us this way. We already know in Brit Ben Abtarim, Hashem told Abraham that we will be strangers in a strange land. The secret of the purpose of Galut now is brought by the Haver as a parable for this little seed, Gargir Achita. A seed of wheat. Gagir zeha mutsna adama, the seed that is hidden in the ground, nirkav veneras, it deteriorates, it disintegrates and is destroyed. Lichorazo shtut la rosita gargir. And the surface, it seems foolish. Why would you want to destroy a seed? Lafho, la boats, to turn it into mud, bamaim, bamalach vikvono, to turn it into mud and water as it disintegrates. Tachadzot. Why not just eat the seed while it's complete? If it has nutrients, it has the DNA of whatever it is, just eat the seed. It's a very narrow uh, um, surface perspective. The seed that's buried in the ground is, includes everything that's around it. Mayim ve'afar matzmiach it's water, earth, it grows, a new growth, complete and big. That on top of it, you have one seed, keep in that mind, one seed gives birth, so to speak, to thousands of seeds. We have a clementine tree in our backyard, and we had, Baruch Hashem, a big crop this year. And the one negative is they have plenty of seeds in them. So for one seed or whatever it was, we had thousands of seeds. From the power, the source of power of that one seed, I'm just paraphrasing, look what we get out of it. It's a wonder. In the service, it would seem that this seed just disintegrated, disintegrated and uh, rotted and turned into mud and water. But in truth, who kalat et kol elementim svivo? It absorbed all the elements around it. Vavcham lechelik me mahuto and turned them, the water, the dirt, the the the, the nutrients in the soil, 
and turn them into its existence, its essence. Who gibesh kochotav, ba'fachet akarka hagasa, this little seed basically acted to turn this thick ground, it's a multiple meanings, lepri meshubach mudan, from this clump of clay of dirt, now turns into a beautiful, something special, it's beautiful. Zoe geonuta yetzira elokit, that is the genius of this concept of, of, of God, of godly creation. Obviously, where's he going with all this? So take a look <coughs> back in the text. The Chaim Torah Moshe. So too, when it comes to the Torah, Hashem's Torah, Torah Moshe. Second. Kol asher ba'achavea yishtaneh ileha bamitat inyano. V'imhu benir'eh docheota. Other religions that came along after Judaism, they will eventually um, um, will they transform the essence of the truth of the Torah, even though they may seem to reject it. These other nations that have transformed the Torah, who have rejected the Torah, are really laying the groundwork for the Messiah, for the Mashiach we await, Asher Hu Apri. That is the fruit. Eventually, all nations will all then admit and turn into this one tree. Again, this is metaphorical. Then they would understand the root that they all came from. I'll explain in a minute. I'll come back to that Pasuk in a minute. He's saying, here's the mashal. We, not we, even though, yes, we are in a certain way, we are in Galut and Israel too, because we don't have Beit HaMikdash, but let's say in Chutz The people living in Chutz are like that seed and that they're surrounded by the non-Jewish world. They're like the, the, the earth. They're like the water that, that, Eventually, the Jewish people, like the seed, will make use of the elements around them. Well, with by keeping Torah mitzvot, will bring about the recognition of Hashem's name by all nations. And then the very Torah and the very people that the other nations rejected and dismissed, well, then they'll realize that the root of who they really are and who God is all came from the Jewish people and from the Torah to Moshe. What is this pasuk he's referring to? So let's take a look at that. I have in front of you the pasuk from Yeshayahu. That's <coughs> um, called Hine Yaskiladi, and I have the Rashi's comment on it. Pasuk says, Hine Yaskiladi, indeed my servant shall prosper. Yarum Vinisa, the Gava Meod, will be exalted and raised to great heights. This is a messianic idea that we will be on the top, that Avdi in singular means Am Yisrael will be elevated. Rashi says at the bottom of the screen, it will be in the end of days, Avdi Yaakov, Tzadikim Shebo, that we will be, we're called, remember, because we said Altira Avdi Yaakov, uh, we're going to see it in the Parsha very shortly, not this week, um, I don't think. Um, be good if I knew the words by heart. Um, that and then other Malbin says that Avdi first, even though it's in singular, first to all of Amisol, Rashi interprets it as, as Yaakov. But the idea is this is a Nevua from Ishayahu, and it's in other places as well, obviously. That will come the day that we will not be just the seed, that we will be the one flourishing, we'll be the one that's on top. There won't be the, the pogroms, there won't be the Talbanim and the Crusaders and all these other things. That there is going to be an end to the galut. Now, the rest of the paragraph, which I'm going to save for next week, the rest of this paragraph where he's going to be talking a little bit more about comparing our position in this world to the others, to the non-Jewish world, uh, and then talk about Torah observance versus non-Torah observance, and try still to answer the original point of the king, which was, what are you doing in Gullus? What are you doing there? Obviously, it's not a good thing. He's going to still work on that a little bit more. 
And when we will see more in the next paragraph, that it is, it will appear, even though that he's seeming to say it now, but even stronger, that, that people are in Galut now, as far as a nation, not as individuals, but as a nation, as part of God's master plan. Because, says the Kuzari, that, that the big picture, God runs. The individual, that's up to the individual. Now, it sounds contradictory. A person who's in Galut is a family. He's saying, now, if I read this, I will, I'm staying. This is God's plan for me to be here. Does that mean if I, make Ali, I made Aliyah that I went against God's plan? No. So what's going on? So we'll see a little bit more Bezrat Hashem a little bit next week. Um, same bat time, same bat channel, Bezrat Hashem. Hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank Amen. you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Very welcome. You're very welcome. Thanks, this, Rabbi. This will, on, this will be on YouTube, Bezrat Hashem. All right. All right. Be well. Have a good day. <laughs>